What does it take for you to pursue your deepest desire? To blaze the trail to bring your vision to reality. Meet Mr. Nick Martin a teacher at St. Andrew's School Turi who has followed his passion of sustainable development. Mr. Martin tells us the inside story on what prompted him into sustainable living. Hello, well here you have uh, Mr. Martin in his online uh, natural environment. Uh, this is where I live when I'm not in school um, and today I'm hoping that you will have a little look around uh, what drives me, what my passion is and partly maybe why I think science is such an empowering uh, branch of knowledge to have because if there's anything that's applicable it's science. We don't need the laboratory and we don't need the Nobel Prize winners. Science is accessible to everybody and it can really enrich and improve our lives. So today, as we take a look around this compound, um, we will take a look at uh, the house and how it has been constructed and the various features it has. We will take a look at the uh, garden where we get our food from, the flowers, and then the natural environment. And I hope from at the end of this, you'll get some little ideas, one or two things that you think, hmm, yes, maybe one day in my house, I would like to do something like that. Come on. Um, you want to build a house. Of course, you need all of the basic amenities, electricity, water, hot water, um, that sort of a thing, heating in your house. So how do you go about it in a cellular model where you're taking care of yourself? So let's take a look this direction. First of all, water. I built a story house so that the roof would be high. The gutters from the two sides of the house go straight into those two 4,000 litre tanks. From the bottom of the tanks, you'll see pipes coming out, they go into the house. They therefore supply water by, rainwater by gravity to the shower, the toilet, the kitchen. So we have never ever missed water here. We decided in case there was a dry time, we would add more tanks so there are, as we're on a hill, we've added more tanks on the hill level with this. So we now have 20,000 litres of water stored. It's only from the rain and we have never missed water. So how about you want hot water? We've got two ways of heating water. One of the ways is using the sun. Here is the solar water heater. We can look at it from above. Being a scientist, of course, I need to know exactly how it works. There are two types. This is the evacuated flask solar water heater. The radiation goes in, it heats the water, but then there is a vacuum on the outs near to the outside of the pipe, and that prevents any conduction or convection of heat going out. So even in cloudy weather, whatever little heat there is, it warms the water. 300 litre tank, again, we have never ever missed hot water. And in sunny weather like this, you can actually put the hot water direct into your teapot and you can make tea with the water from this uh, um, water heater. Down below, make good use of the space. There is a store and there's even a store below that water tank that the cat is presently guarding. Okay, so what about electricity? Well, you won't see this easily from here because I've hidden it on the top of the roof. Um, I have put 490 watts of photovoltaics to collect the sun's energy, convert it into electricity at about 15% efficiency. That power is something that I have now never missed in seven years of having it. Inside the house, there are the batteries. We've used LED lights because they are power efficient. We have got a fridge which has got good insulation. 
A laptop typically takes about 20 watts, so we've been able to do all the online teaching without uh, any sign of a power cut yet. So the lighting that we put in are these small strip LEDs. Um, one of those strips is about two watts of power and when, when you buy a strip like this you buy 150 LEDs on a strip and you just solder the wires on um, next to no cost. Uh, it might be um, 1,500 shillings for the whole roll. I'll show you something else. In the evenings it sometimes gets cold here. Occasionally we get frost. So I built myself a fireplace. And I said to myself, hey, you know what? I'm going to have big logs of fire. But then I found I didn't need such big logs, so I had to redesign it. So I've redesigned the fireplace to be narrow and to have this diagonal shape. So when the bricks get hot, the heat is thrown out. In addition, I've given it a slope at the back. Again, it pushes the heat out. So it uses a small amount of firewood and produces a lot of heat. At the back behind it, because this is actually only a temporary structure, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a load of water pipes. So when the fire is hot, the water pipes become hot and I have a second source of heating. So how do I make the best use of the heat from this fire? I've given myself a big metal chimney. So when the fire gets hot, the metal chimney gets hot and the heat from the metal chimney comes into the room. It goes all the way up through the bedrooms and heats those rooms at the same time. I'll add one more thing. What does a fire need? A fire needs wood in order to work. So if you ever design yourself a fireplace, have what is equivalent to a bookshelf but full of all the wood you need. So you don't go out and bring wood in all the time. We are fortunate here because we have some very nice types of wood such as this, which is olive. Olive is the number one firewood. It smells great and keeps burning for ages and ages. Um, we can take a look in here. Of course, if you're going to be making lots of things, you need all your tools. So over this side, I have a whole array of the various tools that I would typically use. Some cat and dog food, of course. And there are then these uh, solar fridges. So very low power, very thick insulation, and that now keeps everything cool. And these fridges are portable and they work off the solar and again we don't have any problems of power cuts. Let's take a look up here. So let's imagine it's one of those cold grey toury mornings and you really fancy feeling a bit warmer. We built this conservatory as an afterthought. It faces east it's all transparent and it warms up immediately. Even in relatively cloudy and drizzly weather, it's always warm here compared to the rest of the house. So this is a place to come and have your breakfast or to bask when you're feeling cold. You'll notice that the flooring in the house is all local wood. Uh, that we were able to get, so we did not have to transport it. My study area is over there. That's where I do my online teaching from. And 
if we take a walk around here, we can see the rest of the solar, the workings of the solar. So in your solar system, you need your um, charge controller that stops the batteries getting over or undercharged. Uh, four 100 amp hour batteries. And then this is an inverter because the solar is 12 volts DC and this converts it to 240 volts AC so that you can have any normal appliances there. Um, I do actually have two solar systems there. So that's the second system. Uh, just in case one developed a problem, that gives me the reliability. And uh, if we look at solar systems, the batteries are always the tricky bit. Um, that um, big black picture there is a brass rubbing from a church in the UK and those are apparently direct ancestors. Here lieth the body of Nicholas Martin Esquire who departed this life and slept with his fathers the 23rd day of March 1595 and left behind to inherit his lands uh, daughters uh, Catherine Elizabeth, Fran Francis, Jane and Anne whose soul assuredly does rest with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So that comes from the floor of a church in the UK. Right, um, that's a look at the house. So we're probably, we're probably through for the house, unless you want to see the kitchen. Don't think there's anything much to be seen here, other than that the water is hot. Uh, yeah, maybe I can at least prove that the water does work. Okay. So there's the water from outside, from the rainwater. I put it on hot at the moment. I tried to keep the pipes short so the hot water comes through quickly. And now it's coming through and now I can't keep my hand in it anymore. It gets very, very hot indeed. Lovely. Not sure what else there is. So you've seen the, the big features there. Okay, so when these tanks get overfilled, which happens the whole time, you'd be surprised how much rain falls. The excess rain comes down these pipes, goes under the ground here, and then goes down to a pond. So we walk down here. So over here we have uh, a pond, which is from the overflow water from the house. And that overflow, it flows out through a little duck pond and continues gradually sinking into the soil as it goes down the hill. You can see that the aspect of the site is quite a steep hill. That gives some disadvantages, but also you can always use it to your advantage. So the drainage of water is excellent. That's the cesspit from the house. So any waste water would go into there. From there, it sinks into the earth. And then it's got about 300 meters to break down. This cow is called Namunyak. She's very friendly. Namunyak is Kimasai, a name that is given to somebody which is born with luck, with good luck. So she's had one calf and she's lactating at the moment. And you can see how friendly she is. Her tongue is like sandpaper. That cow there is called Narok. Narok because she is black and the word Narok means black in the Maasai. And she's also got a calf and is also lactating. Okay, so I got tired of people leaving gates open all the time. So then I made this design, okay? And this is where being creative and confident really helps. 
So what I've got is a little bar here and this bit here that sticks up. So when you push it to close, it falls down and it holds the gate closed. When you want to open it, that's what you have to do. So we've made that automatic latch so that the gate closes. The monkeys, they've been here, I think, this morning, to be precise. So they love coming here. And I think our dogs, they love, you know, they, they just get excited when they uh, see. It's like Olga Bazard. Uh, okay, so yeah. let's see the, the, the monkeys. Often in the morning they come to this station. Just to Blue monkeys and colobus, those are the two that we have. Lovely. And then of course we have a section which is still indigenous trees. So looking up here, there's just lots of indigenous trees from bamboos to the dombeas, uh, all kinds. And this is usually the place where you get the most wildlife, you get the most birds, you get the most invertebrates because they really love the indigenous plants. This is my walk. Most of the time I take my dogs for a walk all the way to the river. Okay, one of the really beautiful trees around is this tree here, Polysachis kikuyuensis. It just always looks stunning and it's often left because it again it doesn't interfere with crops and its timber's not much good but it does look really good. So this is River Sakinda. Uh, it flows from not far from Turi down to the way to Lake Natron in the end. It marks the boundary between settled land and the Matai Nau Forest, which is on this side. Uh, East Africa's big, biggest closed canopy forest. 